I have to say that it's great to be back with you guys. It really is. And uh, I have to say that I've seen a major improvement in one specific aspect of uh, Ground Zero, and that is the cuisine is incredible. <laughs> Whoa. I've just been uh, filling in on things here, and uh, actually, I asked for some chocolate, and I got some Girardelli chocolate, so if I fall asleep, uh, that's, uh, I, I won't fall asleep. Uh, actually, we have some serious stuff to discuss today, and uh, not all of it is a hap happy stuff, uh, for us Americans at least. Uh, let me begin by setting the stage of, uh, you know, I was going to say that uh, <clears throat> during World War II, we were al actually allies with those hated Russians. Can you believe that? Yeah, we were allies, right? And we suffered about 440,000 killed, all soldiers. Um, how many did the Russians uh, suffer? How many killed uh, Russians in World War II? Anybody know? 40 million. Pardon? 40 million. Uh, 26 million is what uh, Putin says. Most people say 27 million. Putin tries not to exaggerate, if you can believe it. But I'm not going to say that. <coughs> uh, I'm not going to talk about that. I'm going to talk about what happened after the war. After the war, um, there was a new National Security Act set up with CIA and and the Air Force was created and the Department of Defense and so forth. And uh, George Kennan, who is the expert on Russian and whom I learned so much from in terms of his books and his writings about what you need to do to face down the Soviets, he wrote the first policy planning uh, memo from the new State Department policy planning staff. And it's quite remarkable, uh, I have it here I had it here. Let me recite it for you. We, the United States, have emerged from this war with 50% of the world's natural resources. We have domain over 50% of the world's resources. This is 1948, okay? But we only comprise 6.3% of the world's population. Therefore, we have to do all we can to maintain this disequilibrium. We can't be sidelined by soft thoughts like human rights or other soft things that don't make any sense in practical terms. It's going to come to the exercise of hard power. George Kennan, before I learned about that, he was my hero. <laughs> That sets the stage. Okay, now everybody, all of you know that we're the exceptional country, right? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Some of us probably believe that, at least subconsciously, that we're the exceptional country. Uh, Putin himself uh, wrote an op-ed for the New York Times after he had pulled Obama's chestnuts out of the fire by persuading the Syrians to destroy all their chemical weapons back in 2013. Remember, they all wanted Obama to go to war on Syria, open war, okay? And Obama said, I don't want to do that. I'll go to Congress. And he said, you don't have to go to Congress. Yeah, that's archaic. You don't have to go to Congress. He went to Congress. He still didn't want to do it. He went and talked to Putin, and Putin said, look, you know, we can get out of this because we can persuade the, the Syrians to destroy their chemical weapons under UN supervision on a ship outfitted for such destruction if you allow us to use one of your naval ships like that. And Obama said, really? <laughs> Anyhow, that was the deal. That was done. During all of this, Obama, that is Putin, got an article or op-ed in the New York Times, and he, he said, I am really happy at the increased trust, remember that word, trust, uh, between not only our two countries, but between President Obama and me. Then he, he ended up this last uh, part of the, the op-ed by saying a very curious thing. He said, the only thing I subject to uh, is what, what President Obama said just last week in a major speech, and that is that there are exceptional countries. I don't think there are any exceptional countries. I think that there are good, 
bad countries, there are people closer to democracy, people farther away, developing. But I think when God looks down at all countries, he sees them as equal. End of op-ed. I was reliably informed at the time that he penned that last paragraph himself. And I got confirmation of a sort three years later when an uh, interviewer asked him, uh, you know, off out of the blue, uh, the same question about exceptionalism. And he repeated those words almost verbatim. So let's get rid of this exceptional business because uh, as uh, George Kennan thought, he was, a, he was a patrician and he was also pretty much a little bit of a racist. As, as, good, a, uh, uh, as good an analyst of foreign affairs he was. So um, uh, next thing I'd like to simply talk about is uh, well the end of the the end of the Soviet Union. The Soviet Union falls apart at the end of well 1990 really, uh, but the Berlin Wall fell in November of '89, uh, right? And uh, I. I retired about that time uh, from active uh, duty in the, uh, in the agency. And at that time, it looked like, uh, you know, there might be a real uh, friendship growing uh, with a new Russia, a Russia that was, doesn't want to take over the rest of the world, right? So I left, uh, and several of my colleagues left, Soviet experts, uh, clapping ourselves on the back and saying, wow, <laughs> we did it. Yeah. Yeah, there's going, to be, there's going to be peace. Peace is going to be breaking out. I could go work in the university, which I went and did, which I always wanted to do. And it didn't turn out that way, did it? No. So what happened exactly? Uh, I think it bears repeating that in 1989, George H.W. Bush uh, was talking already about a Europe free and complete from Portugal to Vladivostok in the Far East. And when the Berlin Wall, wall fell, he called Putin and he said, um, we're not going to take advantage of where you are now. Your, your empire is falling apart. Your country is falling apart. We're not going to dance on the Berlin Wall, is the way George H.W. Bush said it. I know him quite well. I used to brief him every other morning when he was vice president. I think he meant it, okay? And he sent his secretary of state, um, James Baker, kind of a smart lawyer from Texas, and uh, he, um, he talked to Gorbachev and Shevardnadze, the foreign minister, and he said, uh, you know, the president wants me to work out things so that we have a new peace order in Europe. Um, so. Uh, the first thing we, we want is a uh, kind of a reunited Germany. Now, when I heard that, <laughs> I didn't want a reunited Germany. Maybe I saw too many war films when I was a kid, huh? Maybe I spent too much time in Germany, five years altogether. Some of my best friends are German, right? <laughs> Blatt. I was scared out of my mind. Reunited Germany? So uh, Gorbachev says, wow, that's, uh, that's kind of a, a, a bitter pill to, to swallow. Uh, what's the quo here? What, that's a big quid. What's the pro quo? And uh, then this fancy lawyer from Texas said, no. Let me put it this way. Um, how would it be if we promised, cross our heart, hope to die, not to expand NATO one inch further toward the east, toward you guys? How would that be? Well, put yourself in Gorbachev's place. The place was falling apart. He fully expected to get economic help from the US as well as other help. They went back, slept over it, came back and said, all right, it's a deal. Promise? Cross my heart and hope to die, okay? Uh, now, James Baker was a lawyer, right? Now, what do you do when you're a lawyer, when you have that kind of agreement? What do you do? You yeah, write it down! <laughs> my father was a lawyer. He would say, get it in writing, right? 
Now, do you think Jane Baker forgot to get it in writing? <laughs> I don't think so. Suffice it to say that just a few years later, under Bill Clinton, uh, NATO doubled in numbers. All of those countries were, guess where? More than an inch to the east of East German border. Now, Gorbachev became very unpopular in Russia for not getting it written down. Uh, and of course, getting it written down, you're not real sure that it's going to be abided by anyway. Um, you know, we had a. Putin spoke to his major military leaders on December 21st, 2021. And he said, look, this time we've got to get it written down. Uh, they violated the, or they ended the ABM treaty, they ended the INF treaty, we've got to get it written down. And he looked at, at all those admirals and all those generals in front of him, and he, I think he could sense them thinking, right, right. Was it the ABM treaty written down? Was it the Intermediate Nuclear Forces Treaty written down? Right. So what happened? That was the 21st of December, 2021. On the 30th of December, the White House gets a call from the Kremlin. Uh, Putin wants to talk to the president right away. <clears throat> uh, right away? Wait a second. Why? Our negotiators are getting together in Geneva uh, on less than two weeks from now, on the 9th and 10th of, of January. Why does he have to talk to him now? Well, uh, he wants to talk to him. Now, to his credit, Bush took the call. And what came out of that call? The readout was, Mr. Joseph Biden, that's what the Russians call him, Mr. Joseph Biden said that Washington has no intention of putting offensive strike missiles in Ukraine. Whoa, what are those offensive strike missiles? Well, uh, there are already holes in the ground, capsules, to launch offensive strike missiles in Romania and in Poland. How many of you knew that? Okay, what do we call them? We call them ABM missiles to defend against whom? They're not in the right place to defend against Russians. Defend against Iran or maybe North Korea or Iran, right? Then we had the, the agreement on Iran and, and Putin came back and said, well, okay, now <laughs> Iran's not gonna have any nuclear weapons anytime soon and you keep building these things. Now I have a little clip. Maybe we could play that one first, Tom. It's, uh, it's a clip of Putin uh, talking to some Western journalists, and this is uh, June of 2016, if I'm correct. And it's really bizarre because he starts out, well, they were up there for an economic summit, and uh, he, so he had a captive audience. He invited them in, and he started out by saying, now, I'm realistic, and I don't expect you to write, write up what I say. I don't even expect you to tell your editors what I say, but you guys are, are, are knowledgeable. I'm going to tell you how I really feel about these offensive strike missiles. Uh, can we see that, Tom? Они реально все были отклонены. Но вот все-таки пришли к тому, что сейчас построили систему ПРО в в Румынии. Говорили это все время о чем? Нам нужно защититься от иранской ядерной угрозы. Где ядерная угроза иранская? Ее нет? Договор подписали уже. И причем Соединенные Штаты были, по сути, инициаторами этого договора с Ираном. Мы помогли, мы поддержали. Но если бы не позиция США, не было бы этого договора. И это, безусловно, заслуга президента Обамы. Потому что я считаю, это договор правильный, он разрядил ситуацию вокруг Ирана. И президент Обама может записать это, безусловно, в свой послужной список как результат своей работы на этом направлении. Но угрозы нет, а система ПРО продолжает строиться. Значит, мы были правы, когда говорили, что нас обманывают. С нами неискренне, ссылаясь на 
на якобы имеющуюся иранскую ядерную угрозу при строительстве системы ПРО. Ну так оно и есть на самом деле. В очередной раз пытались нас надуть. Сейчас построили эту систему, сейчас ставят там ракеты. Так? Но вам должно быть известно, что ракеты эти закладываются в капсулу, которая используется для пусков ракет средней дальности Томагавк морского базирования. Значит, туда закладывают сейчас антиракеты, способные поражать цели на расстоянии 500 километров. Но мы знаем, технологии развиваются. Мы примерно знаем, в каком году примерно американцы получат новую ракету, которая будет уже не 500 километров, а 1000, а потом больше. И с этого момента они начнут угрожать нашему ядерному потенциалу. Мы, мы по годам знаем, что будет происходить. И они знают, что мы знаем. Это вам только вешают лапшу на уши, как у нас говорят. А вы, в свою очередь, веш, вешаете своему населению. И люди не чувствуют опасности. Вот меня что беспокоит. Ну как, вот, как мы не можем понять? Мы, мы тащим мир вообще в, в совершенно новое измерение. Вот в чем проблема. Делают вид, что как будто ничего не происходит. Но я не знаю даже, как достучаться. Ну, и вот, и о чем говорят? Это э, часть оборонного потенциала, не наступательного. Это э, значит, системы, которые, э, которые призваны оградить от агрессии. Это неправда, это не так. Система, стратегическая система противоракетной обороны – это часть наступательного стратегического потенциала. И все это работает в единой связке с наступательными ударными комплексами. Одни прикрывают, одни наносят упреждающий удар высокоточным оружием, другие прикрывают от ядерного ответного удара, третьи значит, наносят сами ядерный удар. Это все в комплексе решается, в комплексе современном неядерного исполнения высокоточным оружием. Значит, ну, Ладно, вот эти противоракеты, которые будут развиваться и будут все больше и больше нам угрожать. Но э, вот э, в эти чехлы, куда закладываются эти ракеты, я же сказал, что они э, берутся с кораблей, э, и там э, эти шахты, так скажем, используются для томагавков. Но там можно вообще просто за несколько часов поставить туда томагавки и все. И это уже никакие не противоракеты. Откуда мы знаем, что там в этих шахтах находится? Нужно просто изменить э -э, программу. Все. Это э -э, работа абсолютно незаметная. Не... До Румынии никто не будет знать, что там происходит. И что допускают Румын туда, что ли? Никто не будет знать, ни Румыны не будут знать, ни поляки не будут знать. Я знаю, как это делается. Это, на мой взгляд, это большая опасность. Вот когда-то мы обсуждали с нашими партнерами американскими, у них была идея создания баллистических ракет в неядерном исполнении. И мы им тогда сказали, слушайте, но вы понимаете, что это такое или нет? Вот у вас будут стартовать ракеты с подводных лодок, с территории. Стартует баллистическая ракета. Мы же не знаем, есть там ядерная головка или нет. Какая, на какую, какую угрозу вы будете создавать? Но, насколько нам известно, сегодня эта программа не осуществляется, они ее остановили пока. Но это продолжают. К чему это все придет, я не знаю. Но, мы, но я знаю точно, что мы вынуждены будем отвечать. Только я уже заранее знаю, чтобы нас будут обвинять в агрессивном, опять в агрессивном поведении, хотя это только ответ. Но ясно, что мы должны будем обеспечить безопасность. Не только свою. Но нам очень важно обеспечить стратегический баланс в мире. И еще раз вернусь к этому и закончу ответ на этот вопрос с того, с чего начал. Вот именно этот стратегический баланс обеспечил, гарантировал мир на планете, гарантировал нас от крупных вооруженных конфликтов за последние 70 лет. И это благо. Хоть оно такое, знаете, основанное как бы на взаимной угрозе, но тем не менее взаимная угроза, она обеспечила нам глобальный мир на протяжении десятилетий. Как его можно разрушить, так я не знаю. Мне кажется, что это очень опасно. Не только кажется, я в этом уверен.
Okay, Tom. <coughs> okay. What kind of missiles is he talking about? Tomogok. Tomogok. Uh, the Russian doesn't have any H like we do. So they're Tomogok missiles. And they can, they can reach uh, from where they're, when these holes are already in place from Romania and Poland, they can reach Moscow and some of the ICBM forces in seven to 10 minutes, okay? Now, when the U.S. gets hypersonic missiles, as the Russians and the Chinese already have now hypersonic, now some of us are old enough to remember um, Mach 1, right? What's that? Mach 1, speed of pound, right? Mach 2, you get a MiG-5 Mach 3 or a Roop. Would you believe Mach 8, Mach 9 is how fast these guys go? And there's one on a, on a ship just launched from the north of Russia patrolling the Atlantic Ocean now with Tsirkan missiles, which can go in less time than, than, than seven minutes. So uh, what, what Putin is trying to explain to these Western journalists, and he was right to begin with in saying that they would never report this. <laughs> Have you seen it in any of the major media? No. Okay. So he was realistic in his expectations, right? So now he also said, Okay. Any of you have Russian? Yeah. 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 So they know that we know. In other words, they have this plan to, to put these bigger range missiles there. They're going to not have ABMs because they don't make any sense besides the Iran farce is gone. And so, and he's not his name. They know that we know, okay? Now, is this true? Yeah. I mean, check with any of the experts, like Ted Postel, for example, uh, who used to work for the chief of naval operations. I said, yeah, but Ted, how would they get those missiles into those holes? He said, Ray, it gets dark there at night, they could do it overnight. And Ray said, oh, come on, they're big, big missiles. He said, you know what it would take, Ray? It would take a line truck, you know, like when your electric lines go down. You, you, you wheel up a line truck and you put these hypersonic missiles or you put the tomogoks in these holes. You change the computer. You, you put in a little new disk, okay? And you can reach Moscow if it's hypersonic. You can reach Moscow in five to seven minutes. Now, I mean, I hate to appeal to, uh, to reason here, but if you, were, if you were Putin, would you want to have, would you have, want to have less than 10 minutes to decide whether to blow up the rest of the world? And he's made it clear that, you know, if there is that kind of attack, He's, he's, he's up to doing that because one person asked him about that after his last election and he said, well, you know, what would the world be without Russia? So there's a real problem here with what we call intermediate nuclear forces, which is a treaty signed in 1987 and which was observed until 20. When did, when did, when did uh, Trump leave? 2019. Trump got out of that one. <laughs> not, not soon enough, is that what somebody said? <laughs> I, I, this reminds me, I, I, I have my wife's uh, warnings in my ear here. Ray, for God's sake, so they don't, know, don't Trump, the, so they don't think you're in Trump's pocket here. Tell them what you think of Trump. Okay, so, so I think Trump was the very worst president the United States ever had. I hope we'll never have a worse one. I don't think we can have a worse one, but that's what I think of Trump. But the truth is the truth. And when he said Russiagate was a hoax, he was speaking the truth. And now we know that if we look in the right places, look at the Twitter, the Twitter uh, revelations where the FBI was inside Twitter telling Twitter what it could publish and what it couldn't publish. 
And look at the testimony of the head of CrowdStrike, the cyber firm that was hi hired by the Democrats to look into the hack of the Democratic National Committee. The head of, of, of this cyber firm, uh, CrowdStrike, his name is uh, Henry, okay? And uh, he decided that, well, he didn't decide, they called him to testify. December 5, put this, get this in your mind now, December 5, 19, 19, 2017, December 5, 2017. And they said, now you looked at the, the problems with the Democratic National Committee computers, right? How did the Russians hack into it? And he said, he talked to his lawyer, <laughs> uh, no one hacked into the DNC. No one hacked into the DNC. But you, you, did, a, you did an investigation. Oh, we did an investigation. Actually, the Russians didn't hack. No one hacked into, the, into those computers. We, we didn't see any exfiltration uh, of this, and we looked at all the stuff. Well, hello, it was clear to us, and we wrote a memo on this in December 12th, 2016, right after Trump was elected, saying it was physically, and we use the principle of physics and what our NSA members of, of VIPS knew, and we said it had to be a thumb drive, not a hack, but a leak, or whatever you want to call it. Somebody put a thumb drive into that DNC computer, a computer uh, copied, not downloaded, copied it from the computer, put it in their pocket, and took it to where WikiLeaks published it. How many of you knew that? Well, you know why? You can be forgiven. Because uh, uh, Adam Schiff, of recent memory, thank God. Uh, well, no, he's still around, but he's, uh, he's, he's, off, the, he's off the Intelligence Committee. Um, uh, he, uh, he kept that testimony secret for two and a half years. Now, Trump was, he was a lot of things. He was sort of, he was not wise to the ways of Washington. He didn't realize, oh, I'm president. I could get that, I could get that testimony released. All I have to do is say, hey, Schiff, you'll release that testimony, or I'm going to have to release it myself. Well, it took him two and a half years to do that, but he got a new national intelligence director in, and they said, Schiff, you release that, or we're going to release it, and he released it. That was the 7th of May, 2020 folks. Now, I said at the time, hmm, I wonder if the New York Times is going to beat Adam Schiff in suppressing this still longer than two and a half, two and a half uh, years. And guess what? <laughs> they have. It's been more than two and a half years since this was released officially into the, into the common domain, and the New York Times has suppressed it since. Wow. So none of you know that, it's, uh, that, that our NSA technicians, our NSA actual, actually they were technical directors of NSA when they were on active duty, Bill Binney, Ed Loomis, Ed Loomis, PhD out of Princeton with the, the, the last computer knowledge, Bill who knew chapter and verse, and, and it's, Ed Snowden chipped in here, okay? Ed Snowden released the charts that showed how they tracked these, these things, and we were able to say again in December of the same month that, that Schiff took this testimony, we were able to say that it had to be a leak and it wasn't a hack. Now, who do you suppose leaked that? Who do you suppose put a little thumb drive or so, some other kind of external storage device into that computer and copied it and gave it to WikiLeaks? Anybody? anybody? Oh, good. You guys all know the game to play. No one's going to mention any suspects because then you might be called a conspiracy theorist. Okay, one of you summoned the courage to say, are there any suspects? Are there any suspects? Pardon? Are there any suspects? Say it again. I can't hear you. Are there any suspects? 
Are take the thing off. Are there any suspects? Are there? Yeah, there are. Sounds good. Tell me. Could you name the guy's name? Was he the guy that was killed? Yeah, the guy that was killed. Right. By a failed robbery where they didn't take any money or any watch or anything. You guys don't know his name? Come on. Yeah! Who said that? Go to the head of the class. <laughs> Seth Rich. Now, what does Seth Rich issue, why did he issue a subpoena to Ray McGovern to account for uh, McGovern's denial that there was a Russian hack? He did that. Fancy lawyers, they hired, subpoenaed me, Bill Benny, Ed Loomis, others who wrote that memo saying it, wasn't, it couldn't possibly have been a hack, subpoenaed us. They wanted to look into all our, to, to see how often we communicated with Putin. Huh? And we had to answer those things. So, I mean, it's just by way of saying, if you mention this word, Seth Rich, okay, people are gonna say, you're a conspiracy theorist. You're a conspiracy theorist. You can't possibly believe that the FBI, under instructions from the DNC or from Hillary personally, did away with the fellow who did this stuff. Otherwise, you're a conspiracy theorist. Let me tell you how conspiracy theorists got its, got its real pizzazz. John Kennedy was killed November 22nd, 1963. Curious thing happened, LBJ set up a Warren Commission and he appointed uh, one person who pretty much ran the commission. Anybody know who it was? Alan Dulles. Yeah, got it, yeah, Alan Dulles. And what was his claim to fame? <laughs> he was previously head of the CIA. And people said, you know, this is a little curious. A lot of people suspect that the CIA had a hand in the assassination of JFK. And you're appointing Angela Dulles to, to the Warren Commission? And guess what those people were called? Conspiracy theorists. Consp so it was Alan Dulles who invented the term. I mean, it put it in real use. So we're gonna get that now. Now I warn you, you're gonna hear more about Seth Rich because there are some extant lawsuits that are, are pursuing this. And uh, you call me a conspiracy theorist if you wish, but no, none other than Julian Assange mentioned Seth Rich and offered a $20,000 reward for, for information leading to his killing. So it was sort of a no-brainer no in my view. Uh, he may have not actually been the person who downloaded this, but uh, he's a prime suspect and it speaks volumes that very few of you knew that. What else could I do here that uh, is a little bit different from what you hear even on uh, alternative sources? Yes, please. I'm sorry to be thick, but what was the motive? What was the motive? What was the motive? What was okay. The theft of the thumb what would be the motive for somebody like Seth Rich to do that? Yeah. Rich worked for Bernie Sanders. <laughs> he had all access to the DNC communications and all that stuff, and he saw how Hillary Clinton stole the nomination from Bernie Sanders. I mean, that's enough motivation for me. Now again, uh, all I know is that the FBI has actually uh, hidden all their data on Seth Rich. They have his computer, and we know that now, and only because of these lawsuits are we learning that, for example, the FBI was monitoring all this stuff and What's the latest thing? Uh, the, the FBI said they would like to have how many years before they divulge this stuff? Anybody remember? 66 years. They want to say, oh, this is top secret. Uh, give us 66 years before we tell you about Seth. Oh, uh, hello? Anybody smell a rat here? Well, okay. So anyhow, maybe this will suffice to say that, that we have to really, uh, well, my, my son who, created and runs my website, says, Dad, if you don't mention our website, I'm not doing any more work for you. <laughs> he just puts a lot of work into it, okay? So the website 
is raymcgovern.com. And then Joseph, my, my son, says, now, Dad, after you say that, always say, if you don't get it, you don't get it. But I, I'm much too humble to, to say that, so I'm not going to say that. <laughs> uh, I want to make sure that we leave enough time for some suggestions about what we're going to do. But I don't want to deprive you of, uh, of another clip. Could we show the one with Victoria Nuland and... and uh, how, well, let me ask first, how many are familiar with the conversation between Newland and uh, the, the U.S. ambassador in Kiev? Uh, raise your hands high. Okay, there's enough that haven't, so let's, oh, here it is. Now, you, listen, this is in English, and let me just introduce it by saying that this was intercepted uh, in late January 2014 and put on YouTube. YouTube on the 4th of February, two, 2014. YouTube. McGovern sees this on YouTube and he says, oh, poor, those poor uh, coup plotters. I mean, the thing is blown. That's the intelligence way. They, they, they blew it. It's blown. So there's not going to be any coup in Kiev. Well, I wasn't the only one that was wrong. Vladimir Putin was at the Winter Olympics in Sochi. And I'm sure he was briefed on this. I said, well, phew, I didn't know they could do this coup, but it's blown now. So he stayed in Sochi, threw the coup, came back the next day. And it was then and only then that they figured what they would do. And Crimea, of course, was the prize. Since that's their prime only all winter, all weather naval port created there by Catherine the Great, for God's sake, about the same time we had our revolution. So... So this is Newland, uh, who's the Assistant Secretary of State for European Affairs, talking to Jeffrey Pyatt, uh, who's the U.S. Ambassador in uh, Kiev in Ukraine. And you can, I mean, it's not really hard to understand, but do, play a, do pay attention. What do you think? Uh, I think we're in play. Um, the the uh, Klitschko piece is obviously the complicated electron here. Um, especially the announcement of him as Deputy Prime Minister. And, and you've seen some of my notes on the troubles in the marriage right now, so we're trying to get a read really fast on where he is on this stuff. But I think your argument to him, which you'll need to make, I think that's the next phone call we want to set up, is exactly the one you made to, to Yachts. And I, I'm glad you sort of put him on the spot on where he fits in this scenario. And I'm very glad he said what he said in response. Good. So uh, I don't think Cleet should go into the government. I don't think it's necessary. I don't think it's a good idea. Yeah, I mean, I, I guess you think what, in terms of him not going into the government, just let him sort of stay out and do his political homework and stuff. I'm just thinking in terms of sort of the process moving ahead, we want to keep the moderate Democrats together. The problem is going to be Tony Book and his guys. And, you know, I'm sure that's part of what Yanukovych is calculating on all of this. Um, I, I, kinda... I, I, just, I think Yats is the guy who's got the economic experience, the governing experience. He's, he's the guy, you know, what he needs is Cleach and Tony Book on the outside. He needs to be talking to them four times a week, you know. I, I, I just think Cleach going in, he's going to be at that level working for Yats and Yuk. It's just not going to work. Yeah, no, it, I, think that's, you know? I think that's right. Okay. Good. Well, do you want us to try to set up a call with him as the next step? My understanding from that call, but you tell me, was that the big three were going into their own meeting and that Yats was going to offer in that context a three-way, you know, the three plus one conversation or three plus two with you. Is that not how you understood it? No, I think, I mean, that's what he proposed. But I think just knowing the dynamic that's been with them where um, – Klitschko has been the top dog. He's going to take a while to show up for whatever meeting they've got. He's probably talking to his guys at this point. So I think you reaching out directly to him helps with the personality management among the three, and it, and it gives you also a chance to move fast on all this stuff and put us behind it, behind it before they all sit down and he, um, he explains why he doesn't like it. Okay, good. I'm happy. Why don't you reach out to him and see if he wants to talk before or after? Okay, will do. Thanks. Okay, I've now written, oh, one more wrinkle for you, Jeff. Yeah. Uh, 
can't remember if I told you this or if I only told Washington this, that when I talked to Jeff Feltman this morning, he had a new name for the UN guy, Robert Seri. Did I write yeah. you that this morning? Yeah, okay. I saw that. He, he's now gotten both Seri and Ban Ki-moon to agree that Seri could come in Monday or Tuesday. Catch this okay. now. So that would be great, I think, to help glue this thing and have the UN help glue it and, you know, fuck the EU. And what else? No, exactly. And I think we've got to do something to make it stick together because you can be pretty sure that if it does, if it does start to gain altitude, the Russians will be working behind the scenes to try to torpedo it. And again, the fact that this is out there right now, I'm still trying to figure out in my mind why Yanukovych that. But in the meantime, there's a party of regions faction meeting going on right now, and I'm sure there's a lively argument going on in that group at this point. But uh, anyway, we could uh, we could land jelly side up on this one if we move fast. So let me work on let me work on Klitschko, and if you can just keep, I, I think we want to try to get somebody with an international personality to um, come out here and help Listen. the midwives this thing. And then the other the other issue is some kind of outreach to Yanukovych, but we probably regroup on that tomorrow as we see how things start to fall into place. So on that piece, Jeff, uh, when I wrote the note, uh, Sullivan's come back to me, uh, VFR, saying you need Biden, and I said probably tomorrow for an attaboy and to get the deets to stick. So okay. Biden's willing. Okay, great. All right. Thanks. Yo. is seen apologizing for her language yep. in the conversation. Yeah, you saw her say F-D-E-U, right? Uh, and uh, she apologized three days later, not for the coup, but, but for... Not denying the conversation. No, no, she never did. Well, she apologized for saying F-D-E-U. She thought that was undiplomatic, and it was. <laughs> and the EU apparently didn't object in any way. Did you catch the last part there? Uh, who did they arrange to come in? Biden, yeah. And who was the guy to do the arranging? A fellow named Sullivan. So we talked to Jake Sullivan, and if we need an international personality to come in, Joe Biden's ready. Now, think of Joe Biden meeting across the table with Vladimir Putin, as they did on the 16th of June, 2000 and 2021, okay? Uh, Putin knows that Biden was fully aware of the coup in Kiev and, and uh, was willing to participate in it. He knows that Newland pretty much is still, she's number three in the State Department under Biden now. And so, you know, you don't have to be, what? paranoid <laughs> to think that they're out to get you, okay? Um, what else? Uh, Yatsenyuk. He became the prime minister for a little while. Yats is the guy, she said, but not, he didn't last for very long. And uh, let me just add one other thing here, and that is that uh, there's not one scintilla of evidence that it ever entered the mind of Putin to seize Crimea, or more properly stated, do a plebiscite in Crimea and annex Crimea before the coup. Not one little suggestion. Now, why Crimea? I mentioned the primary naval base, okay? But after Crimea was annexed, a month later, uh, Putin made a major speech. And what he said was this, pay attention. We were afraid of Ukraine joining NATO, that's for sure. But more important than that was the creation of offensive strike missiles on our periphery in Crimea, as well as in Romania, and as well as in Poland, okay? So, more important. <laughs> so this is just like, and the analogy is maybe telling for those of us who went through the Cuban Missile Crisis. There are a couple of people with this color hair that I, you know. Uh, in Cuba, Khrushchev thought that he could steal a march in the U.S. by putting offensive strike missiles in Cuba. And he did. And we didn't know it at the time. 
they were armed. They were armed with nuclear warheads. How long would it take them to get to Washington or to Omaha, Nebraska, where we had our strategic air command? Minutes. I talked about seven to 10 minutes or even five minutes with respect to the ones going into the holes of Romania and Poland and now, probably not now, Ukraine. So these were existential threats. What did Kennedy do? Well, Kennedy did some illegal things, didn't he? Blockades are illegal under international law. Uh, he called it a quarantine, but it was a blockade. Uh, preparing to invade another country, which they were doing in, in Key West. Uh, threatening nuclear war, sort of against the UN doesn't, doesn't frowns at that. He did it. Now, how many people remember people standing up to President Kennedy and saying, oh, come on, John, this is unprovoked. Why are you doing this blockade? Why are you, do why are you making all these threats for nuclear war? You've not been provoked. Why didn't they say that? Because it was provocation, pure and simple. He was provoked. Everybody stood behind him and said, we won't tolerate this provocation. We don't want this kind of threat right on, you know, 90 miles off our shores. We want to have more than seven, 10 minutes to, to react to a, a missile strike. And so it was not unprovoked. Now, you hear all the time that the the Russian invasion of Ukraine was unprovoked. And I just want to tell you that that's a bald-faced lie. It was provoked, pure and simple. I've given you some, some hints about it right now. Uh, Putin has said it explicitly. It's not that I believe everything Putin says, but I have to tell you that I read his speeches and I take seriously what he said, and I dare say that the people advising Biden about these kinds of things are uh, neophytes, sophomores, and just uh, infused with this exceptionalism that uh, puts them, sets them apart, and doesn't allow them to see the real world. So what do we do about all this? Um, what is it? 90 years ago, in a place called Germany, the Nazis took over because the German people couldn't find their voice. The Nazis were a minority. Social Democrats caved. The Centrum Party of the Catholics caved. They were all afraid. They kept their mouth shut, and so did the church to its great discredit. It's sort of a repeat performance now in Germany. Uh, what about us? What are we going to do? Well, people say, well, it's impossible. What would we do? That's not an excuse. We've got to figure out what to do, and we've got to figure out what to do uh, in, a, in a strong way where we'll be heard and where the rest of our fellow citizens will understand what it's all about and realize that they've been lied to. You know, I, I like to cite uh, Will Rogers' old aphorism, uh, the old uh, comedian. Uh, the way he put it was, the problem is not what people know. It's what people know that ain't so. That's the problem. <laughs> Our fellow citizens have been exposed to six straight years of brainwashing on how evil the Russian people and the Russian uh, Putin are. I have people accusing me, people I used to work with, are you in Putin's pocket? Why do you say these things? It's crazy. Pe people hate Trump so much <laughs> that they can't think straight. I call it the Trump derangement syndrome. <laughs> so, so what do we do? Well, the thing, big thing was we don't wait around and do nothing because the time is short. As Martin Luther King used to say, uh, there is such a thing. There is such a thing as what? Too late. Too late, yeah. Okay, so um, now you're going to run into the syndrome that Cesar Chavez used to run into. Uh, when he ever planned that action, he'd say, okay, let's, uh, let's, let's do this. And most of his people, no, no, Cesar, there aren't enough of us. 
there are enough of us. And he would always say, there are enough of us, but nothing's going to happen if we don't take action. And so the great boy boycott, incredibly successful. All kinds of gains for the workers out there in, in California. So there are enough of us. I guess I will confess that as I go around the country, I have for the last 20 years, uh, there's a typically American, I think, reluctance to appear foolish or to appear unsuccessful or to appear naive. Nobody likes to be laughed at, right? Nobody likes to be called a commie or a poutine friend or whatever. And uh, one of my teachers, his name is Daniel Berrigan, he talked about this. Some of you will recall that, that he and others ran this uh, draft card burning outside this little uh, suburb of Baltimore. And uh, after they were wrapped up by the police, they were put in the only federal building in, uh, in this little dwarf, and that was the post office, right? And they're sitting around the post office in a little circle, and it's interesting because uh, uh, Daniel put this in his autobiography, and he's a poet, he's terrific. And so he says, uh, uh, in the door <coughs> comes a paradigm of a, U, of, a, of a FBI inspector. And he looks at my brother Philip, who still had his cleric sign, and he says, you again. I'm going to change my religion. <laughs> and Dan writes, no higher compliment could come to my brother <laughs> Philip. Say, okay. But on a, on a more serious vein here, here's Dan sitting around, and he, he, he writes about this. I was thinking, was this a good thing to do? Did this make any sense? I mean, people are going to laugh at me, call me a commie, call me a whatever. Uh, what is this worth doing? And Dan says, you know, I came to the realization, and it was a great, great relief. I came to the realization that the good is worth doing because it's good. Now, results, success, results are, are not unimportant, but they're secondary, secondary to the goodness of the act. And as I looked around at my colleagues and myself, I said, well, people will laugh at us and people will kind of say how naive, but uh, it's the right thing to do. Dan made a, so I recommend that thought to you. Dan was asked to give a commencement address about 40 years ago. It was one of these prestigious universities and it must have been the, uh, the good guys who got him invited. So he gets up to the podium and he says, uh, <coughs> Know where you stand and stand there. <laughs> that was it. That was it. Yeah. I, I think they still paid him something, but uh, <laughs> that was it. Think about it. Know where you stand and stand there. The last thing I'll say is that the last time I saw Father Dan, it was, uh, it was right after um, Ed Snowden. Uh, went to Hong Kong and released all the, all the information about crimes uh, against us, uh, the Fourth Amendment being thrown out. And uh, so we had arranged to give him an award, the Sam Adams Award for Integrity and in Intelligence. And we were going to go to Moscow uh, in just two weeks after I saw Dan for the last time. He was at Fordham in the uh, infirmary chapel, in the infirmary. So um, I, I was with two friends. So I said, Father Dan, um, I'm going to be seeing Ed Snowden. I wasn't quite sure that Dan was keeping up with things. I mean, did, he did have six books on his bed table <laughs> with various <laughs> markers in them. So I said, well, I'll try this. I'm going to see Ed Snowden uh, in just two weeks. Now, would you, would you have anything to, to say to him? 
And Dan smiled, he looked at me and he says, we had a sort of raspy voice at that time, right? Said, yeah! I said, what would that be, Father Dan? He said, tell him, tell him he did the right thing. <laughs> I said, okay, yeah. I said, then I, I was talking with Dan Ellsberg just last week. You remember Dan, you spent a lot of jail time with Dan Ellsberg. Uh, uh, what would you want to say to Dan when I talked to him and say that we had this nice conversation? He looked at me and he said, tell him, tell him he did the right thing too. <laughs> now think about that folks, all right? All we have to do is do the right thing. It's gonna take guts. It's gonna take a little bit more guts than normal. Uh, one little hint for those of you who have this color hair, all right? Uh, Americans, uh, you know, they're kind of uh, blasé when it comes to young people getting wrapped up and beaten up and all that kind of stuff, because they got coming to them, you know, they're protesters. People with this color hair, most Americans care about them when they get beat up. So this is an advantage that some of you have to put into play before nukes go flying off in various directions. And I look forward to talking about the nuclear aspects of all this later on when we do our Q&A. Uh, but suffice it to say now that, uh, uh, well, in, in short, uh, Russia's conventional attack on the rest of Ukraine cannot be stopped by any amount of tanks that can get there anytime soon. Tanks, but no tanks. It's going to be... It's going to be a, well, this may be, this may be a little, uh, there's a, there's the FBI dog there with it. <laughs> um, it's going to be a really rough couple of months now because the, the Russians are reinforced and they're on the move. And so the question becomes what to do. And let me just, uh, let's close with a, a quote by a, a very prominent Arschloch. Any of you know German? Uh, okay, what's an Arschloch? You don't have to say it. A loch is the word for hole. Arschloch. Uh, he's the Joseph Borel. He's the, uh, uh, the uh, chief foreign policy expert uh, in the EU. And this is what he said just last week. Pay attention. Let's remember that Russia is a great country and a great nation, and it is used to fighting to the end, almost used to almost losing and then recovering. She did it to Napoleon. She did it to Hitler. It would be absurd to think the Russians, Russia has lost the war and that its military is incompetent. Ergo, therefore, it is now necessary to continue arming Ukraine with the material and military means necessary to wage such a war, which should not only be defensive, but also one that would allow it to take the initiative into its own hands. Hello? I mean, he got the first part, right? Right? So, to, just to finish this off, Russia, Putin see an existential threat. They don't want the kind of threat on their frontier that JFK would not allow from Cuba. They're gonna fight it through. The only question is when they start winning big time, whether the United States will be tempted to use these fancy little, what do we, we call them? A tactical nuclear weapon, low yield nuclear weapons and all that kind of stuff. And that's why I admire you guys here. You're talking about low yield as well as low yield as, as well as high yield. And so that is a, a, an existential problem for all of us. And that ought to, ought to get us off our rears and, and expose the Arschlöcher for who they are. And, and Borel is just one, one example of that. Arschloch, L-O-C-H, is whole, okay? And I don't want to say it because we, we, we like people. But these people don't know their rear ends from their elbow, 
And I'll end it at that. But, you know, I'd end it just saying, look, we all have to do a little part here. And it's going to hurt. I mean, Dr. King, I finished one, one talk I gave on, on Dr. King um, a month ago. Uh, I took a retreat and was involved in retreat work with Vincent Harding, uh, Dr. Vincent Harding, who, who wrote Dr. King's uh, Vietnam speech. And he always, he always used to uh, make a little uh, a point about singing. And uh, there was this old sp uh, spiritual, just sit here. Yes, sir. OK. This old spiritual uh, climbing Jacob's ladder. We are climbing Jacob's ladder. We are climbing Jacob's. And then he figured, well, not many people know Jacob's Ladder, you know, not many people read that part of the Bible anymore. And so he, he put no words to it. <clears throat> and, he, and he did this, he said, that, we are building up a new world. We are building up a new world. We are building up a new world, children of the Lord. Courage, sisters, don't grow weary. Courage, brothers, don't grow weary. Courage, children, don't grow weary, for the day is long. The day is long. We're, gonna get, we're not going to get weary. We're going to do the right thing. Thank you very much. Thanks, Tom.